good morning and happy Sunday to you. We have a special treat today. We have a guest preacher, Brendan Jorgensen, who's one of our um, missionaries that we support, who's working with crew at UNH and also uh, beginning crew at uh, some other New Hampshire colleges as well. So we're very fortunate to have him uh, with us here today. So, um, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day out and it's a great day to worship God. And really, whether it was raining or snowing or sunshine, I could still always say that it's a beautiful day because God is for us and he gives us great gifts. So let's take a moment now and prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Amen. Well, our opening a verse, our call to worship is from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And our opening hymn, 156, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Christ whose glory fills the skies, Christ the true, the only light, Son of righteousness, arise, triumph o'er the shades of night. Day spring from on high, be near, day star in my heart appear. Dark and cheerless is the morn, unaccompanied by thee. Joyless is the day's return, till thy mercy's beams I see, till they inward light impart. Glad my eyes and warm my heart. Visit then this soul of mine, pierce the gloom of sin and grief, fill me radiancy divine, scatter all my unbelief, more and more thyself display, shining to the perfect day. Well, let's take a moment and praise the Lord for the coming of that perfect day, this great day of fullest glory that the Lord has in store for those who are his children. And let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we come to you in the strong name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we are aware of the fact that you are working all things toward a wonderful conclusion that will be of great blessedness for those who you have counted as righteous in Jesus Christ. We will be caught up to Christ in clouds of divine glory. Uh, Father, we shall be at his right hand O oh Lord God, and we will be openly acknowledged by you as your children and also acquitted of all guilt because of the righteousness of Christ. What a powerful and just and beautiful conclusion you have for all of eternity. We will join even with angels and men who are already in heaven and will be received up into that glory and will be fully and forever freed from all sin and misery. Hallelujah, Father. We will be filled with inconceivable joys and made perfect, perfectly holy, perfectly happy, both in body and in soul, in the company of innumerable saints and holy angels, but especially will be there in your immediate presence with the vision and fruition of your holiness in front of us, the Father, the 
the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit to all eternity. And Lord, we adore you for this, for this is right and good. It's your perfect plan. You have alone the power and wisdom to bring about this wonderful conclusion of full communion with you. Uh, Father, we're, we're just so grateful for all that is in store for us. And so we look toward the day when the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. And, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in, in the divine glory of, of holy clouds to meet you, O oh Lord, in the air. And so we will always be with you especially, Lord, with the new heavens and the new earth. And so we encourage one another with this truth and we praise you on this day of holy worship. For you have brought us today out of our homes and brought us into a broad place, even, Father, when we may still have to wor worship remotely, yet spiritually we're in this wonderful field of glory now in prayer and you've rescued us because, Lord, you delight in us. So we're thankful, Father, for all your mercies to us. And we now pray the prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, today we look at the second great commandment. Last week we had this wonderful first great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus says the second is like, is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. We want to reflect on that a little bit. I want to, to uh, use an incident recorded in Luke 10, and it begins with these words. It has to do with a lawyer who uh, believes that he's kept the law, and he, he says, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because Jesus had said to him that you should, you know, affirming this idea that it's right, he should love his neighbor as itself, himself. But he said, but who is my neighbor? And from that flows the story of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus is telling us that anyone who we happen to even pass by the road is, is part of the creation of God, the human beings created in, uh, in that image of God. And, and they have dignity and worth and Yet we recognize, as in that parable of the Good Samaritan, that we may be very different from them. We may have different views on things. We may have different experiences in life than they do. So how can we, in such a, a divided world where we're regularly in the midst of people that are atheists and agnostics, and we're in the midst of people that view, view all, all the issues of the day very differently than we do. How can we actually love our neighbor as ourselves? It is quite a challenge, isn't it? You know, we, we just naturally go towards those who agree with us. And especially we think of the fundamental matters of faith. If you agree with me, then you're my friend. And of course, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. There is a a special family bond, but this commandment says, love your neighbor as yourself. It's not just those who are in the body of Christ and those who share our views on things, but people that can be very different. Well, I wanna give you a thought here as to how we can do this uh, a little better because we clearly know we violated this commandment in thought, word, and action, and we, 
you know, we know that, that our hearts have, have really been filled with so much anger and even hatred towards other people that are our neighbors. We're supposed to be loving them and be willing to be merciful and compassionate towards them. So how can we do this a little better? You know, I think that there's a connection between trusting the Lord and actually being able to fulfill this commandment. You see, if I cannot trust the Lord, then it's especially difficult for me to love someone who I might just be happen to, happening to pass by, who's quite a bit different than me. But if I can trust God that it's by his sovereign appointment that I am passing by this person or that I know this person, that this person is my neighbor or that this person is an acquaintance, and even though he or she is very different than me in fundamental beliefs or just in habits of life, Yet still, I can trust God that he's the one who created this person. He brought me into the presence of this person at that moment. And he is the one who can enable me to keep this commandment more and more to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, when we look into these commandments, not only are we coming to grips with our guilt, but there's also a sense of seeing, look, this is the right way to go. This is the way that I want to walk. This is the way, let's walk in it, right? To love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we can have some sense of confidence. That's the very thing that Jesus wants. And it's the very thing that he fills you with the Holy Spirit that you might do, to love God, but also to love your neighbor as yourself. So with that kind of confidence in Christ, knowing that, look, Jesus is real, and he does pour out the Spirit, sends the Spirit together with the Father upon the church, so with that in mind, let's confess our sins now with confidence in God's abundant mercy for us. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their sins. Restore those who are penitent. According to your promises, declare to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Well, another thing that gives us a, a great willingness to confess our sins is not only believing in Christ, but then also believing that it's his intention that our sins would be forgiven. So 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, amen. Let's come to the Lord now in prayer. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we come to you with thanksgiving. Lord, we want to thank you for who you are. You are God. And in all the distractions of this world, we can turn away from the mundane, from the earthly, from the temporary, and turn our attention toward you, that we might have a God-focused thank you that you have enabled us to know you through your word and by your spirit so that we can focus our hearts upon you. We thank you for that. And we thank you for your sovereignty over all things that you've provided for us everything this week and every good gift that we enjoy in this world. We can take it all back to you and to know that you're in charge. You provide us with good things and you're in charge of the events of the day. So all our hopes and trusts are entirely in you. And then thank you, Father, too, that you're present with us, that you're not just a God who is far off, but you are a God who has drawn near to us. Lord, we also want to thank you for the angels in heaven. We think of the holy angels doing your bidding, worshiping you, oh Lord God. We have an eager anticipation to be in their, in their company one day. 
And to think that they're also even now servants to the heirs of salvation, both those in heaven and even on earth, that we might ourselves be entertaining angels unawares. What an amazing treat that is to think of these amazing beings that you have made and confirmed in holiness. Oh, Lord God, we also then just thank you for the, the great glo- the wonder of being a human being. And we, we just think of the conception and birth of a, of a little baby and what a wonder that is, Father, and how we give you glory and thanks for that. And then not only in our own lives, but in others, we've seen growth over many years, maybe even eventually coming to the maturity of adult life, perhaps uh, being married and, and even having children or grandchildren of our own or even great-grandchildren. Oh Lord, what what a wonder what a wonder it is. And we thank you for the maturity of the of years that you give to your people. And Lord, also that that there's a glorious future ahead of us as human beings to be um, resurrected beings in body and glorified and also in soul and no more sin. Lord, with that in mind and recognizing that we're in a state of weakness and uh, and great even moral difficulty now. Uh, we would lift up to you our brothers and sisters at Exeter Presbyterian Church and and ask that you would help us to navigate this world where we have many, many difficulties. So today we lift up Doug Camp and and the whole Camp family. As uh, Doug's father has had this stroke, but then even beyond that, that uh, Doug needs to try and work with his brothers to care for his mom and his dad at this state of their weakness. And We pray you'd give wisdom to Doug as he completes his time in Arizona with family. We also lift up to you Emily Levitt, who is the daughter-in-law of Stephen and Sarah uh, and the wife of Ben Levitt. We pray, Father, for her as she has a a surgery that she needs to have, even a repeat surgery. We pray for, for the right choice of the right surgeon and for a good successful procedure at just the right time. We lift up to you also Candy's brother, Chet DuPont, who's suffering uh, right now from shingles, and it's been quite painful for him. We pray for relief and for healing. Also for my sister, Grace Lewin, we continue to pray for her as she would be facing this multiple myeloma and the stem cell transplant of her own stem cells being reintroduced after being harvested from her body and now her body in this state of really adjusting to this treatment that's taken place. It's quite difficult, the intense chemo that she's faced, but also now this other procedure. We pray, Lord, that you would cause this to be very effective, Lord, and we ask for your help for her. Also, Father, we lift up to you Sharon Baker's friends, family. We think of of Duke, uh, who has passed away um, this last Wednesday and uh, Tuesday, actually, that this uh, took place. And we thank you that he was able to be with his family, his wife Donna and his children. And we pray for this whole family now as they adjust uh, to the loss of of this great husband and father. Um, we we pray also for, for Sharon as as she mourns with her friend Donna and and uh, the loss of Earl, who she's always called Duke as well. We, we just pray that you would be with this family. We know every loss is significant and, and we just uh, mourn with those who mourn. Father, we also lift up to you uh, organizations and nations around the world, particularly in Europe today. We think of uh, Romanian Christian enterprises. We think of the uh, church support work being done also by the Gildards in France and the Tansies in Spain. And all three of these uh, great endeavors are affected by the present pandemic. And, and particularly in Europe, where there's more of a tendency toward complete lockdown, we know that can be quite difficult, especially for the poor. So we pray for protection from COVID and uh, for wisdom on the part of leaders of all these nations and also for courage on the part of Christians that are trying to serve others in this uh, time of great difficulty. Uh, Lord, we pray that your church would shine through this all. Father, in our own land, we ask that you would grant to us uh, the continuation of religious freedom in 
in our land. And we pray that, that no matter what should happen in, in the United States of America, that your church would really shine with Christian faithfulness and with a peace of heart and a trust in you that would make all the difference in our lives. Now, Father, we pray that you would use the words of uh, John's gospel and the message brought to us by Brendan Jorgensen so that we would see the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, for who he really is, and that we might truly reflect on this fact that we need to listen to his voice and, and to question in our own hearts, are, are we actually giving priority to the voice of Jesus as we should? So we, we pray, Father, for this good illumination and also as we hear the words of Proverbs 14 and a little bit from uh, Matthew 6 and 2 Corinthians 11, we pray that you would be with us as well in hearing these passages in Jesus' name. Amen. So we now will read some passages of the morning here. We have Proverbs 14, our next chapter there. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. A faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and the end of joy may be grief. The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless a man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow down before the good, the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. The crown of the wise is their wealth, but the folly of fools brings folly. A truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people, a prince is ruined. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. The wicked is overthrown through his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge in his death. Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A servant who deals wisely has the king's favor, but his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. 
And now we turn to Matthew's Gospel, our Gospel reading in our normal rotation that we're going through. It's still from the Sermon on the Mount, a couple of verses following the Lord's Prayer. It's Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now we turn to Paul's letters again, and we're looking at 2 Corinthians 11, just the first half of that chapter, verses 1 through 15. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I am unskilled in speaking. I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we have made this plain to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preach God's gospel to you free of charge. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. And what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So that's a very sobering passage uh, for us. And, and now I'm going to turn this over to Brendan Jorgensen, who's going to read from John's Gospel this morning, chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Good morning, Exeter Presbyterian Church. Hope you guys are well. I'm excited to share God's Word with you this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 10. And the, the central idea we're going to be looking at today is how do we have peace in our lives in the midst of uncertainties? Obviously, this fall, there's a lot of uncertainties uh, in our personal lives and in our nation as a whole. Uh, you could name several, but a few are the pandemic, uh, the election this week, the uh, financial uh, recession that we're going to start to see more and more, and uh, our own health, our own concerns about family, our kids in school, um, you know, all of these realities uh, we're, we're faced with. And, and the question is, how, how do we have peace in, in the midst of that? And, and most importantly, what, what voices are we are we listening to in our lives these days? Are we listening to uh, the Good Shepherd? Are we worshiping him? Are we are we uh, trusting in his sovereignty, or are we listening to um, the news might be telling us, or what our own hearts might be telling us, or, or different people, uh, and becoming frazzled and uh, uncertain about the future? Uh, God doesn't want us living that way. Um, he wants us to be listening to his voice, knowing him as our good shepherd, even, even in the midst of life's uncertainties. Jesus certainly promised that life would be challenging uh, for his children at different times. And uh, we're certainly in one of those seasons as his church. And John 10 that we're looking at today, I think, has some, some really helpful ideas in it in terms of how we can have more peace in our lives in the midst of this of this time uh, as we learn to trust him and listen to his voice as, as our good shepherd. 
I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read the first half of John 10 and, uh, and go from there. Lord, thanks for this morning and this chance to be together. I pray that you would bless us with your peace, bless us with your joy. Jesus, I pray that, that we would learn to have our heart and our mind renewed by listening to your voice from your word. Lord God, we know that you are our good shepherd. Uh, today, help us to trust you as our good shepherd, even when life feels uncertain. I pray that you would uh, quiet the other voices in our lives that want us to be frazzled, confused, scared. I pray that instead we would be full of confidence and full of peace today in you because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So open to John 10, and we're going to read 1 through 10. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So right away, you see Jesus opposing, setting up opposing forces in our lives. So on the one hand, you have Jesus as our good shepherd, speaking what's true uh, from his word, speaking what's, what's real. You also have competing uh, voices, competing bad shepherds who uh, want to seek to kill and destroy and deceive us. I think if, if we were honest, uh, we both, all of us feel that tension in our lives. And I think uh, times of uncertainty like this can tend to magnify that battle in our lives. Uh, are we going to believe what our, the world says, what the flesh says, what the devil says in our lives? Or are we going to believe what the Good Shepherd tells about us in our life as we look toward uh, the rest of this year and in the year to come? What, what voices are we going to be listening to? Uh, the context of this this text, this first part, is interesting because in this day, the shepherds of Israel would have these different sheepfolds set up, which were essentially large gates with a big door in the front. And uh, each shepherd with his sheep would come at night and drop off the sheep in the sheepfold. The, their sheep would go out into the field for, to sleep in the evening. And the shepherd would leave and go find his place to sleep. And there'd be one shepherd, and they had a rotation, who would sleep in front of the gate and protect the, the sheep and so that no, no one could come in and steal them or harm them or uh, try, to, try to do anything you know, hurtful. So that guard would be there. And multiple shepherds and, and multiple herds of sheep would enter into these, this one sheepfold. And so probably five to six. And then everyone would sleep, and in the morning, the, the shepherds would come to the gate, be identified by the guard as the rightful shepherd of the sheep. And the, the shepherd would go in and would call to his particular flock. Now, all of these flocks had been sleeping, and they were actually mingling together. So when he would call his particular flock, they would come from... with. Within the crowd, they would come because they knew his voice. They knew their particular shepherd's voice, which is quite amazing. And uh, he would lead out his flock, and they would go off and graze for the day. And uh, and the same would happen with the other shepherds. So what Jesus, the picture Jesus is painting here, that the disciples and those who were there were having a hard time understanding, is he he wants us to actually know his voice as we go throughout our day, all of us hear voices, and I don't mean, you know, necessarily in a bizarre way, but all of us have thoughts running through our heads all the time. But not all of them are from Jesus. Not all of them are God's word. And we need to learn to distinguish 
what those voices are. Because what we're believing, what we're hearing, uh, has huge implications for what we believe about ourselves, about life, about where we're headed, about other people. And Jesus is saying, I want you to spend as much time with me as these sheep did with these shepherds. So they, these sheep spent so much time with these shepherds that they actually knew his voice. They knew how to distinguish it from, from other shepherds, even though they were just sheep. Jesus is saying, you're much more than sheep. You have the ability to, to, to be with me, to know me as your shepherd, to spend time with me so that you can actually distinguish between what's real and what's true and what's false and what's not of me. Um, the things that make us frazzled and worried and angry and anxious are, are not from him. Uh, the things from him in times of uncertainty, his voice gives us peace and gives us joy. The, the, uh, the other imagery he's setting up is that there were um, false shepherds, this, you know, obviously the teachers of Israel in this context. But if you extrapolate to today, uh, a, lot of, a lot of what this would be like is different things in our lives that, that compete with the truth of what Jesus is saying. Um, so in, in the midst of uncertainties, we know from God's word that he wants us to trust him. Whether it's our health or our finances or the election, we, he wants us to trust him that he is totally sovereign over the universe. That there's not an atom in the universe that's outside of his control. That, that he has not only every person, but the universe itself is completely under his control. And it's all heading toward a consummation when Christ returns right on time, right on schedule. He wants us to trust in that. He doesn't say life isn't going to be hard. Uh, in fact, Jesus tells us we're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Uh, no, no, God never promised us an easy life where these things wouldn't happen. But rather, his call to us as his children uh, is to trust that he's in control. Trust that, that he's going to give us the peace and joy and strength we need, even when life is really, really hard. The other side of that is we're tempted all day long to believe that um, the pandemic's out of control, that everything's going to be lost, that, that there's nothing we can do, nothing will work, uh, or, or the election that um, our country is going to unravel into chaos and, 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 and brokenness and we're, there's nothing we can do and, and um, stay in your house and hide. And, um, or with our finances that we're going to all come to financial ruin. We'll have no food, no, 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 no home. Uh, and, 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 you know, if, if you listen to your own heart or the news, uh, it's easy to go to these places where all of a sudden we're believing voices that are not uh, the voice of the good shepherd at all. They're, they're our own flesh or, or the evil one or the, the system of the world around us that Paul talks about, those three enemies that we have, flesh, world, and, and, and the devil. So what, what's one antidote? There's two, there's two antidotes I see in, in this text um, that, that, that we can rely on. Um, the first is the idea of, uh, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Um, and, and what is the abundant life uh, that he's talking about? Well, I thought about that a lot this week. And, and one verse that I, I find really helpful uh, that, that shows what this looks like is from Acts chapter 16. And I wanted to, to just briefly, briefly read it to you guys. It says, as we were going, this is Paul, as we were going, uh, the story about Paul, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaimed you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. When they brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews and they're disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. When they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison 
and fasten their feet in stocks. And this is the key. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. In this text, you see a lot of uncertainty. They had been beaten. They were in the inner cell of the prison. Prisons in these days were not desirable places to be at all. And uh, in the midst of that uncertainty, they still have this abundant life that Jesus refers to in John 10. I came that they have life and have it abundantly. And what does that abundant life look like? Well, for Paul and Silas, they're, they're actually in prison. And they are in a very difficult situation. They're not sure what's going to happen. They don't know the outcome yet. In spite of those circumstances, pandemic, prison, uh, election chaos, uh, they're shackled. Um, of course, there are differences, but there are similarities too in terms of uh, uncertainties. They begin praising God. Worship. They're worshiping the Father. I, I, I'm captivated by that because it, it makes me wonder how much time am I spending in my typical day in the midst of this craziness that we're in every time you turn on the news. How much of, of the day am I spending worshiping God, worshiping the Trinity, praising him, singing out loud, uh, thinking about his beauty as he sits on the throne, uh, in total control of the entire universe, how much, how much time am I spending praising him, worshiping him? So my first antidote I see in John 10 is worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit during this time. Worship him more, more time than you check the news. So if you check the news for half an hour a day, and read the news for half an hour, worship him for 45 minutes. I don't mean to get legalistic, uh, but in terms of applying this to our lives, it's important to have goals. And, and, and what, is, what does worship look like? It, it can, it can work, look different for different people, but um, I would suggest reading the Psalms. Um, I've been loving the Psalms, Psalm 61, 62, 63, uh, 23, 24, 25. Those are great uh, sections of the Psalms that are just praising God, worshiping Him for who He is, for the beauty of who He is, for the glory that He has. Uh, and for us as a, as a church body, what, what are those things we're doing in our private lives? Um, you know, turn on the radio, uh, put on a, a CD of, of worship music, and, and sit alone in your home for 20 minutes, half an hour, and just sing along with these, these, amazing, these amazing songs that... Um, that we can sing. Uh, pray, pray, thank God for, for all the things he's doing in your life, even when it's hard. Um, so worshiping God is, is the first antidote I see. Uh, the first solution to having peace in the midst of uncertainty is, is, is we actually increase the amount of time we're worshiping the Trinity. Uh, we're going to now move on to the second part of John. And uh, you're going to see another, uh, I think, antidote to uncertainty in this section as well. And we'll close uh, after this section too. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again a division among the Jews. Because of these words, many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. How can a demon open the eyes of the blind? 
this this text even more so than the prior really highlights the sovereignty of, of Christ um, which I believe is our second antidote so we're our first is to, to worship him more in this season of our lives the, the second is to reflect on and ask him to help you believe that he is sovereign over everything the first thing you see he's sovereign over is our own salvation and you see that in verse 16 he says and I have other sheep that are not of this fold I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd you notice it's interesting Jesus is saying he has a flock um, his elect he has he has a flock some are, are with him then in this text as he's reading as he's uh, teaching there are some sheep already with him uh, but he says there's others that are going to come too, and they will listen to my voice. You see the confidence in that. He's not saying these other sheep might listen to me. I hope they do. He's saying, no, these, these sheep, they will listen to me, and they will become part of my flock. And that's us. That's his church. That's his body. Uh, we don't we don't choose to be saved. Um, God, in his mercy, comes and rescues us. So that even in the midst of pandemics and and difficult seasons of elections and financial uncertainty uh, we can rest in the fact that we're saved we're saved for all eternity um, we have been risen up with christ and seated with him in the heavenly realms um, we've been sealed with the promised holy spirit and this is not our own doing it's the gift of god not a result of work so that no one may boast it's it's this ultimate act of love, ultimate act of mercy that secures us steadfast in him before creation of the world. So that even as the world can feel chaotic and, and swirling around us a lot, uh, we can take great comfort in the fact that, that our salvation, our eternal glory with Christ has been secured once for all. That there's nothing we can do that would separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. My first encouragement is to reflect on the sovereignty that God has over your salvation in choosing you, in coming to you, in rescuing you, and in sealing you for all time. The second reality of his sovereignty comes clearly in, in verse 18. He says, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up. This charge I have received from my father again you see God's sovereignty just blazing into the the forefront of this this text and Jesus is saying there's nothing outside of my control there's nothing I have authority to, to lay my own life down and take it up if, if I can do that I can do anything and so even in the midst of this time of uncertainty we can trust that God is working he's using these things they're not random. They're not uh, purposeless. Uh, COVID-19 is not purposeless. The, 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 the tension in our political landscape is not purposeless. God is, is using all of it uh, for his glory, uh, for his appointed ends. And, and do we understand fully what those things are right now? No, we don't. Uh, who knows if we're ever going to know fully why these things are occurring. But we can take great joy in the fact that he is completely sovereign over all of it and that he's good. So this week I want to encourage you guys as you think about, you know, Monday morning and the choices we're going to be all be making this week to fill our week and our days with more time spent worshiping the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Praising him, worshiping him even in the midst of hard times. God, thank you that you are beautiful. Thank you that you've saved me. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that no matter what happens, I'm safe in you. Also spend more time reflecting and thanking him for his sovereignty over not only your salvation, but the universe, the world, everything that's happening in our nation. God is completely sovereign over it. There's nothing that happens outside of the will of God. I appreciate this time to be with you guys this morning. I hope this message from John 10, 1 through 21, has been helpful this week. My prayer for all of you 
is that you would draw near to the Father this week. Listen to his voice. Trust that he's your good shepherd. Of course, check the news um, for updates and things that are going on. It's important to stay informed. But don't let it dictate the state of your heart, the state of your soul, the state of your mind. Uh, allow God's word, the good shepherd's voice, to determine the state of your soul, your heart, and your mind. And we know that God's desire for us in Christ is that our hearts, our souls, our minds would be at peace, would be joyful, would be full of hope, even when life's hard. Um, I look forward to, to seeing you guys and, um, and being with you, and I pray that you God would bless you with his peace this week. Take care. Well, thank you, Brendan. And now we continue with uh, the worship of God, and I think it's a very appropriate hymn, uh, 488, May the Mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. This has so much to do with the Good Shepherd and really hearing his voice. So let's sing this together, hymn 488. May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day by his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the word of God dwell richly in my heart from hour to hour so that all may see I triumph only through his power. May the peace of God my Father rule my life in everything that I may become to comfort sick and sorrowing. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea, him exalting, self-abasing, this is victory. May I run the race before me, strong and brave to face the foe, looking only unto Jesus as I onward go. May his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win. And may they forget the channel, seeing only him. Well, now let's confess together our faith using the ancient Nicene Creed, a wonderful statement of faith affirmed over so many centuries by the faithful. So let's confess together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, as we come to the Lord's uh, table tonight, I, I want you to think for a moment about the disunity that we have in the world and sometimes even seemingly in the church. But what a wonderful cause of rejoicing it is that, that there will be great unity coming to the church uh, at the time of glory when we will be with the Lord forever. And this is something that's reflected 
in the Psalms. Think of Psalm 133. I'm just reading from, from the metrical version of that in the Psalter. How excellent a thing it is. How pleasant and how good when brothers dwell in unity and live as brothers should. For it is like the precious oil poured out on Aaron's head that running over down his beard upon his collar spread. Like Hermon's dew upon the hill of Zion, it descends. The Lord commands his blessing there, the life that never ends. So I think it's important then as we would celebrate the Lord's Supper to consider how precious and good this unity is. And it's precious in, the, in this other sense that it's costly. It's blood-bought unity. Jesus, who fully obeyed the law of God with his body, then shed his own blood for us, for our inclusion into this unity that's celebrated in the communion of the Lord's Supper. So we, uh, we don't celebrate that remotely, but we, we do look forward to being together as soon as we can to celebrate that communion together. And even if we can't have the sacrament today, we do have that unity in the body of Christ. And know that you are a part of the body of Christ wherever you may be today. So now we, we come to our, our final Hymn, at this, at this point, it's a, a beautiful hymn, hymn 544, Lead On, O King Eternal. And I know for me, I, I always remember a church that I was a part of in California at, at the earliest stages of our, our faith together as a married couple. Uh, we, we went to a church that they always concluded the service with the third verse of this. So we also sang it in men's group for a while each time at the end of our meeting. It's a beautiful hymn, Lead On, O King Eternal. Lead on, O King Eternal, the day of march has come. Henceforth in fields of conquest, thy tents shall be our home. Through days of preparation, thy grace has made us strong. And now, O King Eternal, we lift our battle song. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. Lead on, O King Eternal, we follow not with fears, for gladness breaks like morning, where'er thy face appears. Thy cross is lifted o'er us, we journey in its light. The crown awaits the conquest, lead on, O God of mine. Remember when we were thanking God in our prayer earlier, one of the things we thanked him for was that he enables us in this life to have a God focus. Oh, I eagerly desire that for you and for me, that everything in our lives might help us to have a God focus, to not be so earthly minded that we're of no heavenly good. So with that in mind, I uh, would offer up to you these good words of blessing that truly come from the Lord, just happen to be through my feeble hands. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Brothers and sisters, be filled with hope. Your future is utterly secure in Christ and no one can take that away.
Have a great week and God bless you.